You are watching DHTV from California State University, Dominguez Hills. Okay, now let's take a look at the Filipino uh, experience. Now, for over 300 years, Spain had colonized the Philippines using Manila Bay as their great seaport, trading silver and rich spices with other countries surrounding Southeast Asia and the rest of the world. In exchange for the gold and the riches, the Spaniards are going to give Filipinos Christianity. And that is why the, the, the Spanish called the people Filipinos. They called them after King Philip II of Spain. And this is why the Filipinos are known as the Latino Asians. When we take a look at the Filipino experience, um, the Latino Asians, this is why Filipinos have uh, Spanish surnames like Bautista or Calderon or Marquez or Santos. But the Spanish connection is going to come to an end after the Spanish-American War in 1898 when America wanted to control the Philippines. Now, unknown to Filipinos, through the Treaty of Paris, Spain is going to sell the Philippines to the United States for $20 million, thus ending over 300 years of Spanish colonization. But the problem is, is that while that Treaty of Paris was being signed in Europe, the Filipinos are going to be celebrating their independence on June 12, 1898, and they are going to declare Emilio Aguinaldo as their president. Because the Filipinos had been fighting Spain prior to American intervention, and Emilio Aguinaldo's troops had captured Luzon, the Philippines' major island, before the U.S. Army even arrived. Aguinaldo appreciated Admiral Dewey's naval victory against the Spanish, and he saw that victory as a de facto uh, alliance with the United States. So he issued a proclamation declaring Filipino independence. The problem is, is that the Americans refused to meet with, quote unquote, savages. And they told the Filipinos to retreat to Manila or face forcible action. So the Filipinos are going to feel betrayed when the Treaty of Paris handed over the Philippines to the United States. Now, uh, I have these pictures here so that you can understand and take a look at uh, Filipino uh, um, uh, Emilio Aguinaldo on, on the left and uh, an artist portrayal of their independence on June 12th. Um, so Emilio Aguinaldo uh, declared Filipino independence, but the Americans on February 4th, 1899, the Americans are going to begin to engage in a long and pro protracted and very brutal war against Filipino troops. And so the Filipino-American War began shortly after the U.S. colonization. The United States is going to go in and take over the Philippines. Now, the Filipinos did not want the United States occupation. It is known in U.S. history books as the Philippine Insurrection. And the Philippine Insurrection Instead of it being called the Filipino War for Independence, this Philippine insurrection that the United States historians identify as, this war is going to last from 1898 to 1902. And it is estimated that some 34,000 Filipino soldiers are going to lose their lives. But what is most important about this is that over 200,000 civilians are going to die directly and indirectly as a result of this war. Civilians are going to be crowded into concentration camps, where as many as uh, some, some estimates reach 200,000. Now, whether you are a civilian or a soldier, American troops are going to view every Filipino with racial hatred simply because of uh, their skin color. And so um, it will be un important to understand that the... Uh, Filipinos are going to face the same racialization process uh, in their home country as uh, people of color in the United States. Now, before the military imposed censorship on war news, reporters are going to write about U.S. atrocities, and they're going to send these reports back to the United States. One reporter is going to exclaim, American troops have been relentless. They have killed to exterminate men, women, and children, prisoners and captives, active insurgents and suspected people. 
from lads of 10 and up. One report says soldiers were short ordered to shoot and kill everyone over age 10. But here in California, newspapers were defending the slaughter. In fact, one editorial from a Stockton newspaper wrote that there has been much, too much hypocrisy about this Philippine business. And they wrote, let us be frank. We do not want the Filipinos. We do want the Philippines. All of our troubles in the annexation matter have been caused by the presence in the Philippine islands of the Filipinos. And the more of them killed, the better. It seems harsh, but they must yield before the superior race. Now, the brutality and the overt racism led many in America, especially progressive women, to rebel and protest. So we're going to go to a documentary film, a, a clip from a documentary film entitled The Spanish-American War, the, Filipinos and the, the Philippines and the Filipino Genocide. And then this, let's appreciate Emilio Aguinaldo and, of course, the politics of war. And many times we can find many examples today that's rooted in the past, in this particular case, of war and the reasons for going to war uh, that the United States is going to use against the Philippines. So let's go to that film clip. In the Philippines, Aguinaldo's insurgents had no promises of independence, no teller amendment. They continued to resist. Within two months, they had killed and wounded 500 U.S. soldiers. Why is it that the American outlook is blacker now than it has been since the beginning of the war? The whole population of the islands sympathizes with the insurgents. The sooner the people of the United States find out that the people of the Philippines do not wish to be governed by us, the better. Harper's Weekly, June 1899. The Anti-Imperialist League that had begun some months before grew in membership. It's very interesting, especially a number of American women got involved in this. They did not yet have suffrage. They saw the Filipinos essentially as having their problem. That is to say, they were being governed without their having anything to say about it. Among the most vocal of anti-imperialist women were members of the Women's Christian Temperance Union. Again and again has my blood boiled at the hundreds of American saloons being established throughout our new possessions. And shame of shames, our military authorities in the Philippines have introduced the open and official sanction of prostitution. Bessie Scoville, Women's Christian Temperance Union. What really upset WCTU members were the reports of sexually transmitted diseases. And they were just appalled to find out that boys who they described as pure boys had left their, their homes and their loving mothers and their uh, strong um, values and went to the Philippines and instead came home sick, diseased, depraved. Founder of the Anti-Imperialist League, Edward Atkinson, published pamphlets on venereal disease and sent them to troops in the Philippines. Atkinson believed that one of the consequences of going into the career of empire was that traditional American principles, such as freedom of speech, would no longer hold. And sure enough, the postmaster general had the pamphlets seized. And so they never reached the Philippines. And Atkinson was able to go to the public then and say, you see, this is what happens. If we seize the Philippines and go and become an imperialist power, we'll no longer have our freedoms. In August 1899, the U.S. commander in Manila requested 60,000 reinforcements, quadrupling the size of U.S. forces in the Philippines. Aguinaldo ordered his officers to begin a guerrilla war. It involved men without uniforms, so they would be able to fade into civilian populations very, very quickly. It involved surprise attacks, raids uh, without warning. Some of the Filipinos would even wear women's clothing at times to be able to get behind American lines and then hit from the back. And the way the fighting went on was just utterly alien to the American kids at the beginning of the 20th century in the Philippines, just as it was to the American kids in the late 1960s in Vietnam. And whenever you send an 18 or a 19 year old out into the world and give them a gun and tell them to go and kill the enemy and to hate the enemy, 
you, you're going to have problems. You're going to have the kind of thing that happened at Wounded Knee, or the kind of thing that happened in the Philippines with the American troops torturing their prisoners in, in the most, you don't want to ever even think about it, ways. American brutality in the Philippines brought an unexpected supporter to the anti-imperialist movement, William Randolph Hearst. Letters that were sent to him from American soldiers talked about killing the Filipinos, who they called Indians oftentimes, connecting it to the Indian Wars in the United States. And I think Hearst started seeing that, that perhaps the whole Spanish-American War was a misadventure, that what possibly worked in Cuba getting Spain out was turning out to be disastrous um, in the Pacific with the Philippines. Just break the news to mother she knows how dear I love her And tell her not to wait for me For I'm not coming home Talk about dead Indians. Are they lying everywhere? The trenches are full of them. Theodore Conley, a Kansas regiment. Last night, one of our boys was found shot and his stomach cut open. Immediately, orders were received to burn the town and kill every native in sight. I am probably growing hard-hearted, for I am in my glory when I can sight my gun on some dark skin and pull the trigger. A.A. Barnes, 3rd U.S. Artillery. I don't believe the people in the United States understand the condition of things here. Even the Spanish are shocked. I have seen enough to almost make me ashamed to call myself an American, an anonymous soldier. The body count in the Philippines worried President McKinley. 3,000 Americans and 15,000 Filipinos had been killed. U.S. generals in Manila were ordered to censor reporters' dispatches that contained any unfavorable news. American reporters in the Philippines blamed the generals not the president, for this censorship and their inability to get a lot of this news out. So by the early part of 1900, McKinley was in much better shape politically than he should have been given the number of casualties and the amount of atrocities uh, that were going on in the Philippine Revolution. Okay, so let me talk about um, the heated debate in the United States about whether or not to take the Philippines. One story has it that was uh, printed in uh, Howard Zinn's A People's History of the United States. One story has it that President McKinley is going to tell a group of ministers visiting the White House how he came to his decision to invade the Philippines. And so here are his words. I thought first we would only take Manila, then Luzon, then other islands perhaps also. And I walk the floor of the White House night after night until midnight. And I am not ashamed to tell you, gentlemen, that I went down on my knees and prayed Almighty God for light and guidance more than one night. And one night late, it came to me this way. I don't know how it was, but it came. One that we could not give them back to Spain. That would be cowardly and dishonorable. Two, that we could not turn them over to France or Germany, our commercial rivals in the Orient. That would be bad business and discreditable. Three, that we could not leave them to themselves. They were unfit for self-government, and they would soon have anarchy and misrule over there worse than Spain's was. And four, that there was nothing left for us to do but to take them all and to educate the Filipinos and uplift and civilize and Christianize them and by God's grace do the very best we could by them as our fellow men for whom Christ also died. And then I went to bed and went to sleep and slept soundly. Now those are supposedly uh, President McKinley's presentation to a group of ministers visiting the White House and how he came to his decision to invade the Philippines. But obviously Emilio Aguinaldo and the Filipinos did not get the same message from God as did McKinley. So U.S. historians call their fight for independence an insurrection. And meanwhile, at home, 
In the United States, farmers and workers are protesting. So, many uh, populists recognize that the Spanish-American War turned their movement into a moment. And Thomas Watson, the leading spokesman for the populists, exclaimed that the Spanish War finished us. The blare of the bugle ground out the voice of reform. And in essence, war became a way to quiet internal dissent. Theodore Roosevelt optimized the solution or epitomized the solution to internal conflicts. He will pick up the tale of reform. And that will be next in our next segment. Mm -hmm.